Hello, everyone. It's nice to have you here for our um, last stream before um, the summer break starts. I'm happy to have Dennis Hong on today from Boston. Hi, Dennis. How are you? Hi, Tillman. I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm good. And I'm happy to have you here and to have a nice and relaxed conversation about investing, especially in internet stocks. But uh, before I start, I want to drop the disclaimer and drop a question for you because you're a passionate dog owner. And <laughs> for the beginning, I have the question, what quality a dog brings to someone who invests on a stock market? What is the advantage <laughs> for an investor to have a stock? But before you answer that, give me a second and let me drop the disclaimer. You find the disclaimer also linked below this video. So you can have a look at it and uh, see what's in there. The main message is do your own work. What we are doing here is a qualified talk and no advice and no recommendation. So always do your own work and do your own research. Thank you. And I also want to say hello to the viewers because you're happy. I'm happy to receive your questions uh, through the chat. You find the chat, um, I think, on the right of the screen. So you can drop in, uh, drop in your questions um, that I could um, take and ask to Dennis. But let's go first go back to the question on the dog. What the dog <laughs> means for investors? Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for having me here. I don't know if you've told the listeners and the viewers today, but you and I first met actually mm -hmm. in Engelberg at RB Capital's yeah. Investor Day. And I think you do an amazing service for the investor community by having Thank some you. really interesting investors on. And you promised no hard questions, but I'll tell you, dogs are amazing animals. And I have this dog, his name is Darby. He's a golden retriever. And I think the one thing that I really admire about dogs is they just have an incredible open mind. They have an incredible, oh, everybody's a friend. And I think with the kinds of businesses that we look at, many of the businesses we look at, if you look at them on first glance, the financial statements, it may not be apparent that there's a really good investment here. Some of the businesses are initially quite cash burning. Some of them just their balance sheet looks like a disaster. But the one thing that um, is, is really wonderful about dogs is that you're, you're a good person until proven otherwise. So I think with that, that's probably a pretty good segue into this discussion on what we find so interesting about some of the businesses that we look at all around the world. So how does a dog react to volatility? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, as I mentioned, you know, you see, like, you can see the corner, yeah. uh, the screen, that, that's, that's my dog bowl. I, I have to tell you, we're really lucky to have this office here in mm -hmm. Boston. We're in this old art gallery on Newbury Street, which... I think it's probably most analogous to a very charming version of Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. And this building that we're in is, is an old art gallery and it's owned by a Dutch family. And they're really kind, very kind people who let me bring my dog to work. So I'll tell you that when you have months like March and everything is in free fall <laughs> and the anxiety is palpable, it's, it's really quite lovely to just have a dog who is just oblivious, just wants love, and attention. <laughs> so um, I, I do say, I do have to say that we're, we're quite lucky. So he also gives a calm atmosphere, the dog, and uh, helps you to focus on other things as well if, if there's <laughs> volatility and the market drops, I think. Yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, it is, it is one thing to um, kind of face this alone with your teammates, but it really is quite another thing when you have a dog that kind of visits throughout the day mm -hmm. when he notices one of my teammates might be really stressed and pulling their hair out. He'll go and put a paw on their, on their knee and say, is everything okay? Everything's okay. <laughs> I think we have to do a test uh, about returns on dogs in, <laughs> in offices one day, but let's skip to other topics. Um, I'm interested how you came to investing and how would you describe your style of investing? But maybe let's start with the way you came to investing. Well, Tillman, that's a great question. I have to tell you, and I have this conversation quite often, I'm probably one of the last people that really should be in this seat. 
And what I mean by that is that I didn't have an illustrious background or a family that has a lineage in investing. I actually am the product of two South Korean immigrants, immigrant parents, my mom and my dad. They relocated from South Korea to this town, a pretty industrial town outside of Toronto called Brampton. And it was actually in my parents' convenience store in Brampton. That's where I learned about business. I, I helped them sell cigarettes and lottery tickets. My parents were prescient enough to insist that they didn't want their son to sell cigarettes and lottery tickets for a living. So I always knew I was going to go to university, even though they didn't formally go. I always knew that was in my plan. So, uh, but I was really lucky. I mean, growing up, I went to public schools. I went to this like pretty rough inner city high school where very few of the students went to college or university. And I had this really great guidance counselor who was like, you know what, Dennis, you've got great grades. You've got an interesting story. Let's throw in a couple lottery tickets to the US and see what happens. And at that time, I'd never lived away from home. So I was really scared. And I didn't even know what an Ivy League was. <laughs> so I did some research and I thought that some of these schools are so cool. So I applied to a bunch of them. I got into Yale, which in many ways changed my life and put me on this professional investor path. So I arrived on Yale's campus. At that time, I was on financial aid and as part of the deal, I had to work. And I did something very pragmatic. I went to the Yale campus job board website and I did a search for highest hourly rate on campus. And there is this position at the Yale endowment. And at that time I thought, oh, this is an easy job. Just call up alumni and hit them up for money. Really mm -hmm. simple. <laughs> Obviously that wasn't the job. And I did some research and I thought, wow, like there's like this really cool investment company here. And so I applied, I found David Swenson's book through the course of that research. And I thought, okay, I really want this job. I really, really want this job. So I interviewed and I was really lucky at that, you know, at the last interview it was David Swenson, who basically just told me, if you want this job, you have it. And I said, yeah, of course I want this job. <laughs> so I joined. At that time, there, there wasn't a lot for me to do. And what I mean by that was that by the time I joined the endowment, David Swenson and his team had been in place for quite some time and they had largely evolved the strategy to what it is, it's modern day iteration today. So picking some very high conviction managers and very thoughtful asset allocation. It was really neat because I had a chance to be at the same conference room as um, people like Seth Klarman and sit across the table from people like Chase Coleman and Steve Mandel, which was very cool. But the managers I found the most interesting were these one or two person shops. Oftentimes they were not really household names and they had very simple st structures, five to 12 stocks concentrated and they often sometimes just manage capital on behalf of just a handful of partners, maybe a family and, and Yale in, in the most extreme case, maybe mm -hmm. just two clients. And it was extraordinary because that was an, a really important early impression for me because it was so clear that these managers had competitive advantage. The fact that they had simplified all their variables and they were really focused on one singular optimization problem, which is generate great investment returns. You couldn't help but see why they had edge. It wasn't that they did better work than anybody else with significantly more assets or that they had some kind of magical machine that told them what stocks to buy, but it was just the thoughtfulness around structuring their partnerships, structuring their investment strategy to be concentrated, long-term, deeply research investments and doing it on behalf of just a handful of partners, when you boil it down to so few variables, you can't help but see why they would have edge. And that was a really important formative experience for me. And there's no secret coincidence why Shawspring, my firm here, is structured the way it is. It, it left a real impression on me. I was one of the lucky ones. I always knew I wanted to pick stocks. So anytime that I was Anytime that I was at a conference room table with a manager, I, I was like clamoring to 
ask that manager, how, how do I, how do I get to your side of the table? How do I get to pick stocks? Right? Like I really enjoyed the manager selection and I really enjoyed the asset allocator angle, but it was just the excitement around digging deep into a public security and meeting with those managers and, and understanding those businesses and why this would make a good investment. It was just something I became really, really passionate about. So while I was at Yale, when a manager had like a really great investment idea, I, I dug in and I was just, it, it concluded. And for me, the conclusion for me was, I, I really want to do this. So I got the blessing of my bosses at the endowment mm-hmm. and they let me interview with a bunch of their managers. And I was really lucky. I, I got into one of their hedge funds and it really uh, was a really special opportunity for me to really grow and learn. And um, that firm was this firm called Matrix Capital, which is uh, a very well-known uh, Tiger Cup hedge fund run by David Goel. And um, it was a really great experience. I, I learned a ton. Um, I was there for two years, but I was the only associate at the time. And there were like probably a handful of really senior MDs, each with various different specialties. So I, I had an opportunity to work with each one of them. So I got to see a lot in a short amount of time. And in that time, I I became the resident technology and internet expert. And I was put in touch with a mutual f- friend, uh, by a mutual friend to this guy called Brad Gerstner, uh, who founded a firm called Altimeter Capital, who, by the way, you should try to get him to interview with you. But um, we were put in touch, <laughs> but we were put in touch by a mutual friend. Um, he was training at a firm called Par Capital here in Boston. And I was training at Matrix. And we both had a passion for internet and technology. And we really hit it off. And you know, Brad launched Altimeter on November 1 of 2008. It was an absolutely horrific time to raise money, but an awesome time to invest. And Brad approached me a couple months after he launched. He said, look, Dennis, I'm looking for a young guy to come in, be my number two, help me scale up this firm. And I told Brad, look, I'll help you scale up this firm. When it's time for me to do my own, I hope you're there to back me up. So I joined, it was early 09, and I just turned 25. And in my mind, like I was thinking that I always knew in my head, I wanted to start my own fund when I turned 30, but I joined this small startup hedge fund because I wanted to help Brad because he, he, he was a really great friend and a great mentor. And, and he continues to be a really great friend and a mentor of mine. And I just thought this is a great opportunity. Now, you know, a $2 million launch, those are the chances that that thing scales a $2 million launch. That's a long tail probability. And so in my mind, I thought I was going to be here for a couple of years. It was a hor- horrible time, right? We were in a financial crisis and I thought I was going to be there for a couple of years and start my fund. Well, actually write a, write a great business school application about what I learned as a hedge fund entrepreneur at, at Altimeter and then start my fund and, and go on my way. But I joined at 25 and I wake up, I'm 30. And we had scaled this thing from 2 million to 400 million. And it was time... And it's time, and, and I was like, in my mind, I was like, it's time for me to do my own. And, you know, I took a bare, a very atypical path to starting Shawspring because I'll tell you, when I looked at my background, just where I come from, and then my experiences, right? Yale Endowment, Matrix, Altimeter, I thought it was an interesting background, but I, I didn't think that any institution was going to take me seriously. So I thought about this as a mental model, Tillman. Seth, uh, Seth Klarman, who was the founder of the illustrious firm Baupost. You know, I remember that he went to Harvard Business School and then got his MBA and then launched out of Harvard Business School, raising money from three professors and started Baupost Group. And in my mind, that was, that was the path for me. I, I thought that I was gonna, I was gonna join, um, go to HBS and I applied to HBS, I got in. And the thought process was, I'm gonna network with 900 really smart, driven, rich men and women my classmates and see if I can show them how smart I am about business investing and maybe raise some money from some of my classmates and come out the other side with some sort of a fund like Seth Klarman did. So that was the, that was the business model. <laughs> but I went to HBS and I actually launched a small fund, like $5 million, mostly my own money and a handful of individuals, including my old bosses who were willing to give me some token support. And I managed money and I went to HBS. I had a really, really great first year, but then the family investment office of a very well-known technology entrepreneur based here in Boston, his CIO reached out to me and 
was like, what are you, what are you up to? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm going to do what, what Seth Klarman did. I'm, I'm going to go to HBS, get my MBA, and then come out raising some money for my classmates and start a fund, like a real fund. And um, the CIO basically said, well, why don't we just help you? <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, it was like, it was kind of awesome because again, like just coming from where I came from, I just didn't think that anybody would be willing to give me a shot. So um, I thought about it. It would mean that I drop out of HBS. And the only problem with that was that it really offended my Korean sensibility to drop out of Harvard before finishing. Well, actually probably more disappointing my mom, but it was like the right decision. I mean, this investor had known me for years, years. They'd invested in funds that I was working at. And, and so they were willing to take a shot and they invested. We launched Shawspring on July 15th, 2014. That's six years ago, six years ago and seven days now. And we launched with $11 million. And that was kind of the beginning of this journey. So six years later, um, we're, um, we're $700 million and uh, we have um, eight institutions, a bunch of um, university endowment funds, charities, as well as some really interesting entrepreneurial uh, high net worth families. We'll have a ninth institution on August 1, another university okay. endowment. Uh, but it's, uh, it's been quite some time. It's been a, it's been a journey. So that's kind of where we are today. Till, so Tillman, now I'm, I'm sitting here in front of you. I don't know <laughs> how, how I deserve to get interviewed by you, but here I we are. There, there's an interesting story to hear. And that's <laughs> the thing I'm doing. Like what were the hurdles for you with founding Shawspring and making it grow? So many things. <laughs> Okay, so the first thing that I sort of think about, right? When you launch an investment firm, there's really two optimization problems as me, the founder of an investment firm. The first optimization problem is to try to gather as much AUM as possible, assets under management as possible, because that's good for me. I get all the fees. Um, the mm, second- that's, that's a problem on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> the, the second optimization problem, Tillman, is that I have to generate returns, right? So mm -hmm. I have to generate returns to justify my existence as a business. Well, you know, it's, it was pretty easy for me to sort of dispense with optimization problem number one, because we have a fairly explicit strategy where we articulate that we're going to put our investors' capital into five to 10 of our very best ideas. So we, we run a very concentrated fund. And that type of fund, the tendency is for quite episodic, sometimes, sometimes alarmingly volatile returns. So it's not right for everybody. Mm, so I'll tell you, you have, that. You have to like uh, <laughs> five to 10 ideas and the journey you're doing. Maybe you have to get a dog as an investor. <laughs> <laughs> so starting out, I did what any other hedge fund entrepreneur or investment firm entrepreneur is going to do. You try to sell. You try to show people what you've got and try to convince people to give you money. But I tell you, Tillman, it's super hard. A fund like ours is really hard to sell. It's not right for everybody. So I think that for me, optimization problem one is kind of out. And I sort of made the bet that if we build the foundations and establish the foundations for building a thoughtful investment strategy and generate good returns for the investors that are willing to come along for the ride for us, then that should be the optimization problem. So for me, since we've launched, we made a quick decision that we need to really focus on optimization problem number two, which is to put in the elements in place to generate outstanding long-term returns. And so like, you know, whereas like, When I first started, I may have had grander ambitions to build a very large fund um, and try to gather as much AUM as possible. You know, we really, really just focused on building the very, very best strategy that we can and just focus on doing a good job for the investors that, that were willing to come with us on this journey. So we haven't grown very fast. 
And I always articulate to our investors, as well as any perspectives, it's been pretty consistent. We've, we've attracted probably one, maybe two institutional investors every single year. That tempo, I think, has been the right tempo. We let investors take their time to get to know us. So one of our investors, it took them four years. They were a really terrific institution that was a wishlist investor for us. They came to visit us when we were tiny, $11 million. I don't know what they thought we would be, but they spent their time getting to know us, getting to know me as a human being, and I got to know them as human beings. And then four years later, they said, I, I think, I think it's, we're ready to do this. And so I think that for us, we keep it really simple, right? Like this is a multivariate problem that we call investing, the investment business. There are variables that are under our control and there are variables that are outside of our control. And I really thought about in the beginning pretty quickly that we need to think about the variables that we can control because ultimately if we think about those in a thoughtful way, um, we can reverse engineer our way to good returns as well as building a really great partnership. So um, that's, um, that's definitely something that um, we've always had kind of from the outset. So, so that's number one, but number two, okay, so we're a small team. So here in Boston, we've got four people, including myself. Uh, I have a, an operating partner and his name is Paul. And I have um, two guys, two young people who help me on the investment side. And actually they're not so young anymore. I mean, we've been together all together for, for quite some time. But um, I'll tell you that one of the things that we really need to focus on from day one is that we need to maximize return on time and effort spent. So this has implications for every aspect of this investment from business, but maybe just applicable for this discussion. How do we take a universe of 40 to 50,000 public companies and narrow that down to five to 10 businesses that we hope, and our ambition truly is, is to generate Hall of Fame returns. How do we do that? And I think that we had to invest a lot of time establishing those foundations up front. We had to think about very carefully just what's going to be scalable, repeatable, replicable over time. And in the event that we've made a mistake, and I'll tell you that our Performance since we've launched has been pretty good, um, but you know we're going to make mistakes, right? So I tell I tell sure. our investors and I tell our prospective investors that I think two out of three of our stocks will probably have very good outcomes. One out of three will probably really stink, and that's okay. But in those instances where we haven't quite gotten it right, we need to be able to reverse engineer how we got to that decision, so we learn from those mistakes. So right up front, you know, I have this young team and I have this preference for mentoring and teaching. I, I love mentoring or teaching. I, I think if I wasn't do this, doing this, I probably would be like a, a university professor or a teacher of some sort. And I'll tell you that because I recruited my teammates out of college, effectively I'm their first job. We sort of had to start from first principles. So what are we trying to do here? We're trying to compound capital. And, and to me, compounding is a very simple definition, actually. So Peter Kaufman, the CEO, chairman of Glen Eyre, who helped Charlie Munger edit his book, Poor Charlie's Almanac, he has this great definition, which I love. Compounding, constant, continuous, um, dogged improvement over very long-term timeframes. That's what we're trying to do. Find investments that are growing at constant, continuous, dogged improvement over very long-term timeframes, which then biases us towards businesses that are growing their intrinsic values. And the only way I understand how intrinsic value grows is because revenue, earnings, and free cash flow are growing at constant, continuous, dogged improvements over very long-term timeframes, which indicates to me that there's probably some sort of high quality characteristic to what we're looking for, right? So I told my team in the early years, just go on Google, find a, find a mental model on Google, how to find high quality company. Well, when you go to Google and you do that, what is a high quality company? You get all kinds of hits, right? You have some kind of Porter's five forces and maybe they tell you, you got to find a barrier to entry or some kind of network effect or maybe some kind of pricing power or switching cost. But those are all abstractions. 
It's not helpful. So we actually had to invest some time up front in our early years to really think through how do we identify high quality quickly? Because again, I'll just bring it back to everything we do here as a small team is that we have to return, have to maximize return on time and effort spent. So it really began with for ourselves defining a mental model for high quality. We spent a year, we wrote a four part letter. Uh, actually, I learned a new word through that process, that's it, uh, a four part series is called a tetralogy. <laughs> but we came up with this um, heuristic on high quality that we call ecosystem control. And what ecosystem control is that every single business exists in the ecosystem of itself, a customer who is the initial catalyst of cash flow into that ecosystem, because that business is providing a good or a service that, that customer wants. And that cash flow passes through various different ecosystem constituents. They could be like the business partners and the suppliers. They could be the employees. They could be the management team. They could be the investors. And what we find through case study after case study after case study is that the very best companies or the highest quality companies, they exhibit this characteristic that we call ecosystem control. We wrote a hundred pages on this and I know we only have very limited time together today. I invite your viewers to contact us and learn more if you're interested. But I think really the only question that we really need to answer for ourselves, very simplistically again, is that do the business's ecosystem constituents, do they love the business? So the business, uh, do the customers love the business? Do the business partners and the suppliers, do they love the business? Do the employees love the business? And we've come up with different metrics internally of ways to measure these things qu quantitatively. And it's been a very, it's an elegant mental model because, because one of the most important things in this screening mechanism of 50,000 companies worldwide is like, what shouldn't we invest in? What's a non-starter? So if the answer to any of the ecosystem constituent questions of whether or not this ecosystem constituent loves the business is, is negative or no, it's like thrown out. It's a non-starter. It's a non-starter for us. But for the businesses where we think it could be true, then the hypothesis could be true that this business has ecosystem control and therefore the hypothesis could be true that this business is high quality, it potentially becomes a candidate for us. So over six years, we developed the shopping list. It's about 300 companies internally that we focus on and they cross geographies, they cross sectors, they cross verticals. We think the hypothesis could be true that this, these businesses exhibit ecosystem control. But really we kind of focus on how does this like 300 stock universe carve out? It's really kind of three areas that we focus on over time. Um, we love the aggregation business. So aggregation business, I, you know, the most common euphemism for that is, is a marketplace or a network, a digital network. And they're really neat. Why? Because there is often a very elegant asset light manner in which these things scale and once you have sort of a competitive advantage and being the very best marketplace of whatever you do, you often have a winner take most or a winner take all type dynamic and you become a quite good business for a very, very long time. We find that in this area, the base rates of success as an investment are quite high. And so they've been a really neat area for us to focus on. So I carve up the world of marketplaces really in two ways. You can be a horizontal marketplace or you can be a vertical marketplace. So you think about like a horizontal marketplace as being like a general classifieds type business, right? So like Craigslist is an extraordinary business, right? That business probably crossed a billion dollars a couple of years ago. It was like growing like really fast. Like that year crossed a billion, it was growing 50%. This is like a business that started in 1996. They basically monetized two cities. They're in hundreds of countries, hundreds of cities, but they monetize basically two cities, right? New York and San Francisco and charge like three and $10 for a real estate posting or like a job posting. It's a really neat business and it's still the de facto place where people go to find roommates, apartments, cars, jobs. Um, at one point it had like a nice uh, dating classifieds area, but it's a neat business. And we find <laughs> examples of these all around the world. We actually recently just took a stake in one based in Japan. And so that's like a really, really neat area to find ideas. And then, then, then there's vertical marketplaces, right? So every horizontal marketplace, you can rip it apart. 
right, to different verticals. So in property in this country, you have like Zillow and Trulia and Redfin and the UK you have Rightmove. In France, you have Sologer. In Australia, you have REA Group and so on and so forth. In the automobile vertical, you have TrueCar, CarGurus, Cars.com, and so on and so forth. In dating, you have Match.com, OkCupid, Tinder, Bumble, Hinge, and so on and Jewish so forth. Dating. <laughs> Jewish dating. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. so, but but the, the, the reality though, right, is if you understand just one mental model, right, the aggregation business, have a mental model for marketplaces, you have created an enormous return on time and effort spent by just understanding one mental model. And you have suddenly a universe of opportunities across geographies, across verticals, and so on and so forth. So that's one area where we specialize. The second area where we specialize is we love vertically integrated businesses. There's certain elegance to vertical integration that I think is sometimes underappreciated by investors. So you probably have a lot of investors who you might talk to Tillman that say, we only like asset like compounders, but we actually really love capital intensity. We love operational complexity. We love really, really interesting businesses that have this vertical integrated component. And we have two examples of these in our portfolio. So like JD.com is a vertically integrated e-commerce business in China. And Carvana is a vertically integrated transactional e-commerce business focused on used cars in the United States. They're in totally different geographies. They're in totally different sectors. But what's common is that they're both vertically integrated. Vertically integrated in the sense that both of them are involved in the activity of directly procuring supply. So it could be general merchandise for JD or like the actual used car for Carvana. They're involved in warehousing those and preparing those things for sale. They're involved in the logistics activities for those types of goods all the way to last mile delivery. So it's not, it is actually coincidental that JD and Carvana hire the men and women whose job is day in, day out. So the last mile delivery is vertically integrated too. They hire the men and women whose job is day in, day out to deliver cars in the case of Carvana to people's houses and general merchandise to people's homes in China. And what's neat is that when you think about the coronavirus sh shutdowns all around the world, whereas the pure marketplace guys who are very reliant on third-party merchants and third-party logistics companies to fulfill their customer promise, both JD and Carvana were able to grow effectively unimpeded all the way through the crisis, which is a really, really neat concept. But the thing is that they take a lot of time to build. They take a lot of money to build. They're very, very difficult to build. But if you can, you can really- make a lot of mistakes. And you can make a lot of mistakes. But if you've figured this business model out, and you've gotten a careful control over the entire value chain of that customer experience, you can be a very good business for a long time because it's very hard to replicate. And then Tillman, the third area that we find some neat ideas is this area that we call cognitive reference. Have, have you ever heard of that? Nope, you have to explain it. You have to explain more things, but start with that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what it is. You do. So I, we didn't come up with the term cognitive referent. Actually, it's a term coined by a Harvard Business School professor called Rory McDonald. But it's an area that we found very intriguing as an area where we found some pretty interesting investments. So think about it in two ways, product cognitive referent or service cognitive referent. Product cognitive referent is really interesting. So think about if you go into a pharmacy and you say, excuse me, do you have any Kleenex? Do you mean Kleenex, the brand name that is owned by Kimberly Clark? Or do you mean Kleenex that is top of your mind and synonymous with the generic category of facial tissue? Ping pong ball, it's the same thing, right? Ping pong is actually a trademark that's owned by a company, but to you, it's synonymous with the generic category of table tennis balls. So that's a product cognitive referent. But I think that service cognitive referents are even more interesting for the simple reason that they are harder to replicate than products, but services are often like, they have controlled distribution often through a native app or a proprietary app. So think about this. Google. I Ubered it. I Ubered it to the office today. Or I'm going to go Airbnb it in Paris this weekend. And you think about like Airbnb, right? As a cognitive referent, it's an ecosystem of hosts and travelers who are looking for each other to facilitate bookings and unique experiential alternative, often urban accommodations. 
Booking.com and Expedia, good businesses, by the way, they kind of do the same thing. But I got to tell you, Tillman, no one's ever said, oh my God, Tillman, that Expedia was incredible. Or gosh, those Booking.coms, they're so great. And most people sort of smile a little bit when you say those things, but it's kind of true because it's kind of natural to say, I'm going to go stay, stay at an Airbnb or I'm going to go Airbnb it. But no one ever says that about Expedia and Booking. And that has real implications actually on the unit economics. So, so cognitive firms have two competitive advantages in that LTV over CAC equation. So long-term value, which is just how much cash flows come in over the lifetime value of that customer over the cost of customer acquisition. So if you have cognitive reference, you immediately have a huge competitive advantage on CAC, right? Cost of customer acquisition, because you have immediate recall. And then on the LTV side, you have very high levels of customer retention because you have this cognitive reference. You almost are synonymous with that category. And there's nothing more stark actually than to just look at the businesses at face value, like juxtaposing Expedia and Booking to Airbnb. So Expedia and Booking up until last year were spending $9 billion on Google AdWords just to get people to go to their websites. Airbnb, in comparison, spends very little on Google. So we look, try to look for cognitive reference of all kinds. So if I were to kind of just summarize again, just my little talk, we're looking for five to 10 stocks. And we have very high underwriting thresholds. So we're looking for 30% IRRs. And here internally, we often say we're looking at five Xs over three to five years. And we're only looking to do this within this universe our shopping list where the starting hypothesis is that these businesses exhibit ecosystem control or they're very high quality businesses. But then within this 300, I think there's three different mental models that we have specialized in where we've identified some of our best ideas. The marketplace business model, the vertically integrated business model, and then the cognitive referent business model. And all we're looking to do is generate Hall of Fame returns on behalf of 15 to 20 partners, full stop. We're at nine partners today. We're trying to boil down the number of variables in this multivariate problem we call the investment business. And that's all we want to do. One question. How do you measure love and businesses? You said you have a certain framework to do that. I'm sorry. What was the question? How do you measure love that people love businesses? Oh, what are your variables for that? Yeah. So there's a lot of different ways you can do it. We do quite a bit of uh, consumer research. And so we look for evidence of just a universality of, of praise, but there's other ways to do it. So I'm sure you're familiar with this concept of an NPS, net promoter score. It's a fairly easy quantitative way to measure how much a consumer loves a business. So an NPS score, what it is, is it's really a survey of like um, a, a sample of people. And I have a sample of 10 people. How many of those are willing to evangelize or recommend that product to a friend or family member or to somebody else versus the detractors who basically say avoid this business. And what we find is that the very, very best businesses exhibit very high levels of NPS. They have very high levels of net promoter scores. And that has real implications, right? Because if you have more word of mouth advertising or you have customers who are willing to evangelize for you, that's enormous competitive advantage on the, on the CAC line again, right? Cost to customer acquisition. And then your loyalty is higher, right? So then your retention is much higher. So what we find over time is one way we can measure quantitatively, do the customers love the business is by just having these like NPS scores. Actually, you can do that for employees too. So we have something called an ENPS. And it's for an employee net promoter score. What percentage of a random group of employees are willing to evangelize this company as a place that people want to work versus those that say, oh my God, stay away. Don't ever work here. And so we've like found little ways over time through pattern recognition, but also just finding ways to quantitatively measure and validate those patterns. How do we measure the, how these ecosystem constituents, how do they love, love these businesses? Do you also take the quality of management into account for this? How yeah. your experience the management, for instance? Yeah, it, I think that's an important part of, of our process. So, you know, I started, I started my um, investment career at the Yale Endowment, doing something very different. But in my mind, I actually find that there's quite a lot of synergies between what I did at the Yale Endowment, which is assess investment managers and their partnerships, the structure of their partnerships and their mm -hmm. strategies, but also them as people. 
it's really important, especially because we want to own these businesses for multi-year periods. So we look for evidence of structures and incentives for how a manager wins. And if the manager wins, do the shareholders win? When we first started the fund some years ago, we actually looked at some really big companies like Visa and MasterCard and businesses like that, that are run by really good managers, but we consider them more professional managers. But over time, you know, this crop of portfolio companies we have currently, the vast majority, actually all of them are effectively owner operators. So it was the entrepreneur that scaled up this business, started the business and scaled this business and continues to run the business but that entrepreneur also has significant personal holdings of stock and which represent a very significant percentage of their net worth. So Tillman, for us, it is really important for us to be able to gauge the intentions of the management team to public shareholders and really for us to understand what are the incentive schemes. You know, there's this saying that show me the incentives and I'll show you the results. I'm a really big believer in that. I think that that's a really, really important thing to be able to get right, considering just our intention to be long-term multi-year shareholders of, of these businesses. That's interesting. To the audience, thank you very much for the first question that came in. You can drop more questions for Dennis. And if you like the interview as I do, please hit the like button. <laughs> that's, a, that's a nice support. Thank you very much for this. Like, I'm interested also in the thing you said about complexity and maybe getting more detail on what you like in it and how do you get a sense that it isn't creating mistakes in a complex environment and to to not getting things done, but trying to figure, figure things out that don't work. Can we dig in a little bit more into yeah. the heart of the question? Like... I'm not. I'm interested in what, what you like about complexity in this this in investments because sometimes it's hard to build complex structures and you fail, and this might also impact your return. Oh, do you mean yeah. some of the more complex businesses that mm -hmm. we like? For example, yeah. like vertically integrated businesses. Yeah. So, we don't look at everything. We've only really specialized really in three different mental model types over the last six years. And vertical integration is one of them. So when we look at a vertically integrated business, which is probably the most complex of all the business model types, I mean, like a marketplace is pretty straightforward in relative terms, right? You build a nice website and you try to scale up liquidity on the different types of parties and try to attract and create a, a virtuous circle of value creation. Which is complex as well, but... <laughs> But vertical integration is tough, right? Like think about, think about like what, I mean, just a simple example, right? Think about what Carvana promises. So you come to our site, you can pick from any, you can be anywhere in the country, by the way, come to our site, you can pick from 20,000 vehicles on our site. In comparison, if you go to a brick and mortar dealership, you're limited by just the lot size. And CarMax does this really well, but they probably only have like two to 300 cars that from you can choose from, depending on whichever lot you go to. But in Carvana's case, you go to the website, you can pick from 20,000 cars. And then on top of that, um, you'll find a car that you really like. And it's typically one to $2,000 cheaper than the brick and mortar competition. And then what we promise is that we're going to help you finance it. We'll warranty it. We'll deliver this thing to your house. You can try for seven days. If you love it, you keep it. If you don't like it, that happens occasionally. That happens about five to 7% of the time. You can return it. But 50% of those returns ends up in an exchange. They want a different model. They want a different color, any number of things. And that's an exceedingly difficult proposition. If you think about it, moving 20,000 cars around the country to be located where your customers are, that's an insane amount of value chain control that you need to have to fulfill that customer promise. It's easier said than done. Mm, but you can lose you know, a lot of money in some fields. But you know if what? You do them badly. Carvana had a hack. 
So, you know, Carvana was born inside the fourth largest chain of physical car dealerships in this country, drive time. So in some sense, they had the benefit of already probably like $2 billion of physical plant infrastructure in the ground. So if you think about it, if you and I wanted to create our own vertically integrated e-commerce business focused on used cars, probably putting two to $3 billion into the ground in the United States, it's just table stakes. So there has to be some sort of unique competitive advantage. I will tell you that we don't look for complexity just for complexity's sake. I think the reality is, Tillman, we've got nine stocks and we don't turn over the portfolio very much. Actually, it's been pretty consistent. We've only added maybe one or two ideas per year. The rest of the time, the vast majority of the time, I actually spend most of my time studying our already nine businesses in our portfolio because I, I think I think those are really terrific. The quality of those businesses is, 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 is really great. We know the managers of those businesses. We're familiar with those businesses. We've underwritten those businesses. So anything getting into the book has to represent a higher quality and a higher return threshold than anything in our book. We run fully invested, by the way. So anything new, has got, we got to take away from, from something we already own. So the bar is very high. But that means that our time is freed up here internally for looking at ideas with kind of above average levels of complexity. We don't see complexity for complexity's sake. I mean, I'll tell you that I would kill to be a great biotech investor, <laughs> <laughs> um, but nobody in my firm, certainly I don't, I don't have a scientific background. I don't have a PhD. I don't have an MD, but we can spend some time in Southeast Asia earlier and than most other institutional investors and do some legwork and develop a network and develop some re relationships. And hopefully those networks and relationships do pay off over time. So that's what it kind of mean by complexity. We don't seek out complexity for complexity's sake. But when we do look at something like a vertical integrated business, we need to understand like, do they have a hack? Is there something unique about this business that's gonna give them a competitive advantage over anybody else? And otherwise it's not obvious. And, and you know, and, and, but but for those but those those instances, Tillman, that we prefer to wait. You, you know what I mean? Like there's some investors, right? Like looking at eleven million dollar Shawstring, they thought maybe it could be interesting, maybe it could be good. <laughs> but if they're good, they're still going to be good five years from now. And and that's the same with us, right? So if we can't get our heads around like what is the unit level profitability of selling one unit of service or one good. And can we make money doing that? And is that replicable, repeatable, and scalable over time? Then we're okay to wait until those are apparent. But if we can figure it out, we're willing to go into the study of businesses with above average complexity levels. I've looked at your portfolio composition. And I think the, the biggest thing that has changed is your size of the cash, cash position. Like maybe to put it in a picture, cash became from a friend of yours to a, something you don't want to have? Or how would you describe your relationship to cash? So full stop, cash represents for me a call option on future ideas, as well as our existing ideas in our book. So every year the market sells off. No question, right? Like the average sell off in the market, if you look measure over, you know, 50 years, the average sell off in the market is probably about 13%. But even that, two out of three years, you still have a market that's positive. And that's a, a really neat feature. So there's always going to be opportunity to back up the truck on our existing book. But when we started the fund, our original thought process was as follows. Cash is a call option on new and existing ideas. So we should always have some cash around. Because in the moment that we have these peak distress, like a March of 2020, <laughs> we're going to have the cash. But you know, one thing that we've sort of learned over time is that our partners, when the opportunities are really attractive, our partners really come through for us. We're in close, active, productive dialogue all the time with our partners. And so we also, I mean, I don't have them in your relationship. So everybody has access to me. I don't have an IR. I don't have a marketing person. I am the IR. <laughs> so 
I'm the PM, you know, if, if the results are bad, it's on me and our investors deserve ha to have access to me. <laughs> so I wouldn't have it any other way. And again, that's why it doesn't scale, right? It's not a scalable strategy. We might have bandwidth for 15 to 20 full stop in this current iteration, but that's what we're happy to do. So our relationship to cash has changed over time for the simple reason that we've just had a nice relationship with our partners, knowing that the balance sheet on our partners or the cash on our, uh, on our partner's balance sheet, we, we could access when the opportunity becomes really attractive. And, and lo and behold, like in March of 2020, I didn't have anybody panic. I didn't have anyone withdraw. In fact, actually we had our partners lean in and that think about that. What a competitive advantage, right? And we don't have very, we didn't run for, with very much cash, right? So like we, we spent whatever cash we had. And then we said to our partners, this is a really attractive time to come in. Okay. The other thing is just a quantitative exercise, right? Actually, like, so Cliff Sosin and I, we've chatted about this. Think about this thought, thought experiment. You and me, we have the chance to buy a business for a million dollars. Okay. We can buy that today and we can earn 250,000 in cash earnings today. Okay. Let's say that in a recession, we can buy that business for 30% off. So we can buy that million dollar business for $700,000 in a recession. But let's say like a recession, what statistically happens once every 10 years. What if we get to year nine and there hasn't been a re recession until year nine? We've basically given up earning millions of dollars of cash earnings just to save 300,000 bucks. So the arithmetic doesn't really make a lot of sense. And I sort of thought like in my head that, you know, having cash on our balance sheet, that's, that's like kind of market timing. And that's not what we're, that's not what we're uh, hired to do. We're hired to put our investors capital in what we believe to be the five to 10 very best ideas that we internally have researched and that we're willing to put our own money into. I mean, I have all my money in this thing. I don't have any other money. Um, so I'm very, very happy essentially this being my PA, that I think for us um, really just dawned on us over, over the years. So it's just, a, it's, it's just a factor of like, we've had six years with the same partners and they've always responded in the way that we expected them to respond. And then just the mathematics of waiting around for a recession to save 30%, especially for businesses that are growing and generating good cash earnings, just hasn't made a lot of sense for us. And you have to get the nine ideas right you're invested in. <laughs> if, if things should work out well. And on that, there's a question coming from Justin. With your expected free third hit rate, have you found characteristics in the losers which have caused you to adjust your larger selection framework? That's a really good question. So I'll tell you that it's been some time since where we had truly an investment that hasn't worked out. And the last time that we um, had made a mistake was um, we, we bought this position in TripAdvisor years ago. And we thought, we thought that there was a real sh chance with this instant book initiative that they were going to try to take some of their traffic. And it, it, TripAdvisor is a fantastic property, right? It's the place where people go to read about hotels and restaurants and experiences and so on and so forth. Great, great, great little digital media business. And we thought there was a reasonable chance they could maybe convert some of that traffic not to leads to other OTAs like Expedia and Booking, but keep solve some of that leakage and keep it internally. We, we thought they could do that, but we totally overestimated the capabilities of this management team to build that type of a marketplace because it's really hard, right? If you think about it, um, you have to scale up a marketplace with millions of alternative accommodations in all the major cities of the world. That's an enormous effort. It's a human capital intensive effort, right? Expedia and Booking.com have thousands of people, boots on the ground, whose job is day in, day out to go knock on hotel doors and say, excuse me, can you join our marketplace? And it was like not, a, not necessarily an investment that TripAdvisor was willing to make. And it was an earlier investment. And that's also kind of why uh, we developed some of these mental models and frameworks. Like how does a great vertical marketplace get constructed? How does a great horizontal marketplace get constructed? What's common? And maybe we would have avoided that mistake on TripAdvisor But there's going to be a couple of reasons why a business exits the book. A couple of reasons. One, we've just started dead wrong, right? So TripAdvisor, we're dead wrong on the thesis. They didn't become an OTA. And number two, um, 
you know, the other reason is like some of our businesses age out. So the most recent business that we departed ways with was, um, was Tencent. And Tencent's an extraordinary business. We've owned that for some time and, and the outcome was, was fine. But at $500 billion of enterprise value, it's just going to be really, really hard for them to generate outstanding returns. And, and for us, like, again, we have this bar. We want to try to annualize our investors' capital at 30%. Well, let's just say that Tencent creates $100 billion in incremental enterprise value this year. That's a 20% gross return on, on that Tencent position. Let's say if they're repeating that $100 billion of entry, uh, creation every single year, you run into kind of the base rate effects that this business is so large that you just have a linear decay in, in the growth. So sometimes like our, our businesses will just, will just age out. Um, I kind of analogize it to some of the investors I really, really admire, right? Like, so, you know, I really admire Chris Hahn at TCI, but he's managing like $40 billion. And for him to generate a 20% gross return, and he's been extremely successful doing this, he needs to find 8 billion in incremental gross profits. And there's only so many ways that you can do that. But you know, for me, I'm 700 million bucks. I need to find $140 million of value creation to generate a 20% gross return. And there's so many different ways I can do that. So we don't necessarily have to limit ourselves to the largest companies. And so we're constantly maybe seeding the portfolio every year with one or two ideas that um, we hope will drive the portfolio's return going forward. But I'll tell you something, we've made a lot of mistakes along the way. I am a lot of like errors of omission, errors of commission that we didn't invest in, right? Like we'll, like we'll study something for some time. And the thing that we have to do here at the firm, again, with just very few people, we need to fail fast. Right? We got to maximize return on time and effort spent. And that's why we like invested in these frameworks and these mental models just to help us like fail fast so that we make fewer of these errors of commission. Now we'll always make, we'll, we'll make them. I mean, just over time where it is, is absolutely clear. Your very best investors like have 51% hit rate. I'm aspiring to a little higher than that. But again, like we're trying to um, allocate all of our efforts to one or two really great ideas a year. Um, but that's, that's kind of, I, I think, how, um, how I think about the, uh, where we're at today. There's a question coming from Hendrik from the chat. Uh, it's how do you decide when to sell or trim a position? You answered mm -hmm. it partly, but maybe is there another aspect on that? Yeah, it's a good question. So one, clearly, if we're wrong, it's out. We're just, it's just out. We are quite KPI focused. So we have key performance indicators for each of our businesses. And we've been fortunate as we scaled up, we've been able to bring on and retain a data science service. So we have this external data science service that gives us some indication of what's going on in our businesses on a weekly, monthly, quarterly basis. So it allows us to kind of stay on top of the businesses and make sure that they're tracking um, according to the KPIs we set out for them. I mean, I'm long-term, but Long-term is the summation of a lot of short-term accountabilities. So I think that if we are going to represent that a business is going to grow 30% annualized for five years, clearly there has to be you know, markers along the way that um, show that we're going to achieve that. I mean, if we underwrite something and we think it's going to grow 30% annualized, but then suddenly we go to like 0% growth or minus 5% growth, and we're just totally dead wrong in the business model, like we're wrong. So... Uh, we have to find ways to course correct in that circumstance. But then trimming and adding, I mean, that's been a real process too. Like, I, I do want, I think this is worth actually a, 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 an in-depth discussion because we've learned a lot about portfolio construction along the way. It's like probably one of the hardest thing that we do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so let me, let me tell you about what we do. And it's still going to be an evolving process for us. When I started the firm, I interviewed quite a few portfolio manager peers peers of, uh, of what I do, and as also just like our partners, our institutional partners, I asked them like, how do you construct the portfolio, right? Like, why do you size like a position like X and, you know, to a, an allocator, I'll ask like, why, why do you size a manager, you know, in this way? And it's hard, it's really hard. The conclusion I drew is that I think a lot of people use gut instinct. And I think we did too, right? Like I, we found ourselves doing it. In the early years, we were investing in like very high quality businesses like Visa. And I feel more comfortable putting on like a 15% position in Visa, but I feel a little bit like ick um, investing in like a position like Just Eat 
which is going to generate probably a far more superior return than Visa, because Visa is a large company, and again, the base effects are going to run in are, are going to catch up with that that business, and 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 Just Eat has this like really long runway ahead of it to continue to grow super normal uh, growth. But why am I more comfortable putting Visa as like as a as a larger size and and and, and Just Eat as a smaller size? Well, here's the reality. So most people, I think, do it by gut instinct. And what they're really probably doing is that they're trying to minimize personal stress uh, and not necessarily maximize return. So internally here, we spent, we spent some time really thinking through a portfolio construction framework. Because I, what I found with my teammates, we were, we were spending a lot of time in our investor meetings, investment meetings, discussing like, well, you know, Visa probably should be like 15%, Tencent should be like 15% because, you know, like they just feel safe. And they're going to generate good returns. But let's like keep the like and I, so like we had to hack like why do we feel that way, and and we could save ourselves a lot of time by just really understanding like why do we why are we um, so reluctant when rationally we're looking at like some businesses are generating much higher return than than other businesses so we came up with a framework where every single one of our businesses when we underwrite a three to five year return uh, return outlook or a three to five year IRR for portfolio construction purposes we realize not all IRRs are created equally. And what do I mean by that? Some businesses are more predictable than others. Some business models are easier to execute than others. And some businesses, if they're based in China or India or Southeast Asia, well, sometimes those can be pretty basket case economies. So we're gonna invest overseas, we have to be paid. So, for each of our explicit IRRs that we underwrite, our three to five year IRRs, we adjust them for portfolio construction purposes across three dimensions. So we think about the predictability of those cash flows. So I'll give you an example. So if we were to invest in a software SaaS business, that is a really predictable business, right? So say like you have a customer who's willing to pay you $120 upfront for a year's worth of service, every single month you recognize $10 of revenue, very simple. Very predictable, right? Ultimate. So at a score of one out of 10, like that'll rank very, very highly, right? But selling like a used car, that's pretty unpredictable. And it's really hard to know when somebody's gonna be buying a car. So that will maybe rank lower on a score of one out of 10. That's again, the predictability of the business. The second dimension is just um, the ease of execution, right? A vertically integrated business is just gonna be much harder to pull off than a business that maybe like is like a food delivery app. So we'll rank order just a business against like the dimension of just the ease of execution. How easy is this business to pull off? And then the third area is just this catch all and macro, right? We're here in the United States. US dollars are home currency. We're familiar with the rule of law here. If we're gonna invest in Southeast Asia, if we're gonna invest in India or China, we need to be paid. So on a score of one in 10, there's a framework that we measure all of our IRRs against. And then, then we have this adjusted IRR. And then we put this into a simple portfolio optimization model that we created internally. Usually for us, a starter position is a 10% position. And our rationale on that is that if you're not willing to put 10% of the firm's capital into the position, you haven't done enough work on the position, you don't have enough conviction, or it's not cheap enough. So it's 10% position or generally no position. And then we cap it out to about 20% at cost. So that's like kind of, uh, that's the, and again, it's all dependent on just how attractive um, the business is from an IRR, an adjusted IRR angle. This is again, just a straightforward quantitative exercise where I don't have to say like, I feel safer making Visa a larger position than Carvana a larger position. Well, now we actually have a quantitative framework where we can talk about in a fairly like systematic way, why we would size from something in a certain way. Now the other, question that they asked was about trimming. Well, some businesses will do very well and become very large percentage of your portfolio. Generally speaking, we are fairly realistic about the revenue earnings and free cash flow trajectory of our businesses. So if the stock really, really runs ahead with no commensurate increases in intrinsic value, so no surprising increases in intrinsic value, we'll trim it back. And that's what our portfolio construction model will dictate for us to do. 
it's just common sense, right? A stock that goes up a lot is, 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 is much more risky than a stock that goes down, right? So like a hundred dollar stock, you can lose a hundred dollars, a $5 stock, you can lose $5. <laughs> so, so for us, like we take a fairly pragmatic approach to portfolio construction, because why, again, we're trying to maximize return on time and effort spent. So instead of like talking about kind of the abstractions of why something should be sized in a certain way, we actually have some quantitative measures that actually help direct the conversation, I think, in a more productive manner, especially for portfolio construction. But isn't there the risk of over-optimizing? Of you're course. Just talking, focusing on optimizing things because you have to get some... I of course, of course. But you know what? It really helps us with with like the outlier positions. So for example, right? So we've owned C Limited for quite some time and that business has twice hit close to 30% of our portfolio. Uh, we sized it at 20 because we thought it was like a really exceptional idea. But every single time it went up, um, you know, the portfolio IRR or the, the position level IRR deteriorated. And we were not necessarily willing to hold like such an outsized position in something where we didn't see commensurate increase in intrinsic value. Now, if like C Limited was outperforming beyond our expectations, we may have more comfort in holding such an outsized position and have a reluctance to trim, but without a commensurate increase in intrinsic value and expectations blown out of the water, uh, it, it behooves of us from a risk management angle to, to size. But you're absolutely right, right? Like we're not trying to over optimize, but it's really to like create some guardrails as well as just a framework for us to have more intelligent discussions, more productive discussions than, than simply like, well, I feel safer with Visa being 15%. Or it also avoids like, these types of situations where um, one of our stocks has done really, really well. And we feel really compelled, just human natural moment. Uh, sometimes humans natural uh, inclination is to like, continue to like ride your winners and but then you know a stock again that goes up is is, is inherently more risky and and so we we generally try to shy away from from that and if we have sort of a framework that is like rational and quantitative it gives us some baseline for us to make those portfolio allocation decisions it minimizes some feelings that aren't productive in a certain way for instance fear that's right there are some Questions from the audience coming in, and I'm also happy about more likes because we only got six. So please hit the like button. Um, it Sebitz is asking a question about um, a Chinese equi equivalent of Kavana. Have you found something? <laughs> My friend um, Stephen, who is a very talented investor focusing on China stocks, based in Toronto. He claims that there's a really great business in, in um, mainland China, in the lower tier cities, focused on luxury cars. It's actually a very traditional dealership, br brick and mortar dealership. It's called, it's called China Meidong. And it's a really neat company. We haven't quite got there yet. We're still doing our work on it. The founder is an MIT educated engineer, and he's really neat. He writes these really great letters. And you can actually just go to the website and download the letters. And I have to tell you that I thought Carvana was really good, but this Meidong is pretty exceptional. And I like the engineering mindset that this founder has brought to this business. He still owns like 60%. He and the founder own like, uh, he and his family own like 60% of the stock. It's not a big company, um, but I think uh, from a, we have not invested in it. So that's the caveat. And I'm not making any recommendation to, to invest in it, but I think, I think that there's a possibility. You know, the thing about China, which is really interesting is that There are many traditional businesses, the traditional kind of compounder businesses like CPG businesses and, and so on and so forth that are growing very fast. Just the structural growth of those businesses are already just the baseline growth is like 20 to 30% annualized because you have a, what's powering that is a kind of the structural consumption upgrade uh, theme. So Chinese consumers are getting richer every single year and they're desirous of um, packaged goods and professional goods and less informal type goods, but more like branded goods and luxury items and so on and so forth. So in some sense, like in mainland China, and I think that it's kind of be an area that I think we focus continuously our efforts in finding some of these really outstanding franchises. 
you don't necessarily have to look at like the the technology companies to find some really terrific returns because just the most if you think of the equivalent of like Nestle in China or the equivalents of uh, some of these like branded CPG companies that many many investors like in the developed world some of these like really, fairly traditional businesses are generating the kind of growth rates that will meet our hurdle rate. Interesting. There's another question from Franz. Best wishes to Austria, Franz. Nice to have you on. <laughs> Only if you want to answer that, um, so you're free to answer it. Which one of your businesses is the most shorted on the market and what <laughs> makes you comfortable owning it? <laughs> It's not I like pretty, the question. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, so the hallmarks of a Shawspring investment, ecosystem control or high quality, a 30% IRR, and there's often some kind of mystery. And that mystery can come in a couple different ways. So sometimes when you look at a company at face value, it'll look like a absolute disaster. And that was very true with a number of our businesses, like most notable Carvana, right? So you look at the, when we looked at this like a couple of years ago, we looked at the income statement. I thought, gosh, this is a short. I'm, I'm absolutely certain this is a short. It's a car vending machine company. It's like garbage. And at that time, like I was looking at the financial statements and I was like, good God, this is a cash burning dumpster fire. <laughs> so. The Germans say Bumsbude. <laughs> So what I like about our businesses is that sometimes there's some kind of mystery and the unit economics are not necessarily apparent from looking at the financials at face value. So there's a bit of digging that's involved. So that's one form of mystery. And then another form of mystery is like, there's often kind of like this hidden asset. So when we invested in IAC in 2016, so four years ago, we were investing in this holding company. So this Barry Diller's holding company. Mm -hmm. We we're investing in a holding company for their stake in Match Group which is the holding company for all the major dating franchises all around the world. And then within inside Match Group, we were really investing for Tinder. And that time, Tinder, we were assessing the financials. It was at a $50 million revenue run rate, not making any money. We thought reasonably like this could scale to maybe like three, $400 million and become profitable uh, over like the three or four years. Boy, were we wrong. <laughs> so that business did like over a billion in revenues, like 70% gross margins, probably, probably like 50, 60% operating margins if they weren't investing. It's an extraordinary franchise and still growing really fast. And so I think that for us, a classic Shawspring investment is one where we can really assess, ascertain ecosystem control or, or high quality characteristics, a 30% IRR, and there's often some kind of a mystery. Oh, the other form of mystery is sometimes, sometimes there's like a larger player that seemingly um, is threatening this franchise. So if like an example is as like Just, Just Eat. So years ago, we invested in Just Eat. At that time, we took advantage of a dislocation because there's all kinds of narratives like Amazon was entering the market and Uber was going to destroy them and Deliveroo was like destroying them. But, you know, a lot of, a lot of real... Um, franchises, a lot of really terrific franchises, especially like the marketplace type, when you have kind of that first mover advantage and you've established yourself uh, as, a, as a dominant marketplace, you can be a good business for a very, very long time. And it's very common that the narrative that you're going to get Amazoned, it, it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't hold a lot of truth. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to say something really controversial. <laughs> I don't even know if like Amazon's really that good at e-commerce. I think what they've built is like pretty exceptional in the United States, but within that context, maybe what Amazon's been able to do in the United States is so notable because all of the competitors are so weak. I mean, who is their competitor that's except Walmart? So if you think about- think The Chinese like, internet space is more competitive in this matter. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, Amazon, Amazon was a very dominant company in the early years of China, Chinese internet. They, I think, had a third of the market at one point. Now they barely even register, not even 1% market share. So, and then even in Southeast Asia, you know, they've had some fits and starts in Southeast Asia, but you don't really hear about Amazon as like a heavyweight in, in Southeast Asia. And, and maybe India is interesting, could be interesting. But I'll tell you that the, when a big guy 
when a big player is entering a market that impacts our business, oftentimes those narratives are, are overstated. And it's, it behooves of us to pay attention when a, especially for a new idea that we might be looking at, if like a big player is quote unquote entering the space, um, it, it may behoove of us to pay attention because their ability to come in and really disrupt the leader, the category leader. I mean, Facebook dating, same thing. A couple of years mm. ago, there was like this narrative that Facebook was gonna take 2 billion users, mine all their information and then make the perfect matches for people. And that makes sense, right? They have all the data, but nobody wants to date on Facebook. And it's a little bit creepy. So, so you know, that time when Facebook made that announcement in dating, I mean, match stock went down and, and that was not a great day for us, but when we really thought about it and really underwrote, can Facebook really make an impact and disrupt what Tinder has built? It was kind of a long tail probability for Facebook dating to be successful. If, when you really just thought about the attributes that make a really terrific dating platform. So I hope, also, that's, I hope that's helpful. I think so. Otherwise Franz can ask another question. I think it's also about incentives because even the smaller company, you have higher incentives to to grow. And it's also the careers of the people in the company are also better affect, affected by this than if you're at Facebook and uh, only have a smaller, smaller part of a big business. Um, I, has, I have one question on how you discount political risks. Because you said, I think it's attached to the idea of getting paid for investing outside the US. That's such an interesting question. So I'm not sure like what context in the US mm -hmm. context or the Trump administration <laughs> <laughs> or, or, or we're talking about like the, the, um, the Chinese Communist Party in, in China. Well, I have a couple of reflections on this. China is a remarkable place to be an investor because in some sense, yes, it is a very closed ecosystem But within that ecosystem, there is an incredible capitalist dynamism. If you think about it, you know, Jeff Bezos has this concept of it being day one at Amazon. So back to the first day at Amazon, right? Amazon's day one and the excitement and the fears and the paranoia that other guys will come in and try to take your business. It's like day one every day for everybody in China. You have to be paranoid. You have to be a hustler, right? It's, a, it's been remarkable. Just I've been like looking at Chinese stocks since like 2005. So it's been like 15 years. And it's a remarkable place to um, invest. When you think about it, um, it, it can be like one of the most entrepreneurial, one of the most like um, dynamic places to invest. Because like if you have a good idea, chances are good that 50 other entrepreneurs have the same idea. And I've raised hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, to chase after the idea. But in that context, if you out hustle, out work, and then you create a business, and by the way, the margins get competed away so quickly. I mean, it's funny, like one of my friends who is an avid investor in China basically tells me that when an entrepreneur tells you that something's going to happen in the long term, what do you think, Tillman, like long term means to you? What's the time span? 10 years? Five when years? When an entrepreneur tells you long-term, it means like 18 months. So if he or she hasn't figured it out in 18 months, they failed. So there's often like quite a very fast uh, validation of, of, an, of an investment or a business strategy in, in China. But I want to just answer the question directly, right? And I'm going to answer it like a little bit more of an out-of-the-box way. So, you know, a, a lot of investors ask me, aren't you worried that the Communist Party is going to screw up Tencent or Alibaba or JD? But, you know, it's been like probably over 20 years since Tencent, which was one of the first companies to go public. And they've had 20 years and they've had like relatively little interference in Tencent's affairs since that time. That, that seems to be a pretty good track record of non-intervention. So sometimes the question I have is that should I worry, be worried about the Communist Party messing up Tencent and Alibaba? Or should I be more worried about the European Union breaking apart Amazon, Netflix, uh, Amazon, Facebook, and Google? And it's really hard to say. 
It's really, really hard to say. So I think that for us, like, I absolutely think that if we're going to invest overseas, especially in an emerging market country, where it's not our home currency, not our home rule of law, not our system, we have to be paid. So a 30% IRR is typically the bar for inclusion into the portfolio here in the United States. For anything we're looking at here in the US or maybe even Europe, it's about 30%. But if we're going to invest in like Latin America, Southeast Asia, China, that IRR has got to be materially north of 30%. Because when we do the adjustment factor for portfolio construction, that explicit IRR, the unadjusted IRR, gets adjusted quite a bit downwards, just given the quality score that we put on the macro front against that IRR. So I hope that's helpful and answers the question. I think so. We are in 2020 and this is kind of wild year. And um, I'm curious what comes in the next month. There are still some left, so we have to be patient. <laughs> <laughs> how Do you have already more indications on how this year and the co coronavirus infected your businesses you're owning and what can you tell us about that? It's been an amazing year from analyzing in that angle. It's been a pretty unprecedented year, right? So what you had basically over the first part of this year is effectively governments all around the world declaring eminent domain over their own economies. Basically, and you had like one of the largest demand shocks you've ever had in history, right? Economic history. And economies also shutting down freely because people stayed at home and It was, it, was, it wasn't only government. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Never seen anything like that. So I will tell you that it's been a, a remarkable year, but like the thing is that many of our businesses are quite um, interesting because they often are sort of the epicenter of disruption anyways. So whether it be e-commerce, it's the disruption of traditional brick and mortar retail whether it be digital payments, the dis disruption of cash payments and other traditional forms of money transfer, or even mobile games, right? Competing for consumer attention from um, physical world activities to virtual world activities. So in some sense, like when I look across our portfolio, we had this like portfolio largely of mobile gaming, e-commerce and digital payments, almost the kind of like the, a very interesting pandemic portfolio. And I'll tell you though, um, When everything sold off in March, right? And everything sold off. None of our stocks were immune. Like we had, we had a very, very tough March, right? One of the worst, worst 30 days of performance, 31 days of performance in, in the history of our partnerships in six years. But you know what though? Um, when you look at the businesses, the, putting the stock price aside, right? Because if, if, if the businesses are intact, we really thought about it in kind of different cut. In, 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 in three different ways. Like we assessed our business across three dimen different dimensions. So we had a, um, we had a, um, we had a, um, uh, a portfolio of, of, of eight stocks and we assessed each of our businesses across three dimensions, right? And so we were in touch with each of our managers. So that's the benefit of for forming long-term relationships with our portfolio companies. You get to know their managers and they give you access. And we spent a lot of time with our LPs, our limited partners. And for me, I thought about just from an investment angle, the world in three ways. For each of our positions, it gave us an opportunity really to re-adjudicate and reassess, like, are these the companies that we really want to continue to hold, right? Because like you have this unique opportunity to course correct if you want. And so we assessed like our business across three ways. So one, um, the most obvious thing, you know, we're fiduciaries for our partners. We want to avoid permanent capital impairments. And I think about the world, of, uh, I think about this term permanent capital impairment very simplistically, is the stock worth zero? So in an era or in a time period where there's an extended one year, 18 months, two years of zero revenues, zero revenues, does this business have the liquidity and the balance sheet to make it to the other side and have the equity still be intact, be worth something? And with each of our businesses, that was true. And so then the next level is we have these long-term theses. 
And we have this thesis that this business is very high quality and it's capital capitalizing on a certain opportunity, e-commerce in Southeast Asia or selling used cars in the United States in a digital format or online dating and so on and so forth. Is that long-term thesis intact? We can accept that revenues and earnings and free cash flow might go down this year. It might go negative. But if we come to the other side, is that thesis still intact, right? Are we still going to be a very dominant business capitalizing upon what we wrote as the long-term thesis for our, our business? And the third area, I think, for us, like which I think is probably really, really important, particularly in the context of we have a one chance, a well, very rare chance to really make an adjustment to the portfolio um, and take anything out and put something else in that meets this criteria. And this final criteria is, I don't want our businesses just to survive. I, I want our businesses to be improved. And I want our business to be even more competitively advantaged than when they came into this crisis. And there's this great quote by Andy Grove that I love, right? And I'm going to just paraphrase it because I don't have the exact quote, but it's like, bad companies are destroyed by crisis. Good companies survive them. Great companies are improved by them. We have an opportunity to buy anything in the world. We don't have to be married to anything that we own at that time period. So every single position, why not like add this additional selection criteria of having a business that is going to not only survive, but thrive and actually become more advantage, uh, be more competitive advantage coming out of this crisis, right? So I don't want our businesses, I don't want our managers to say like, look, we're, we're, we're going to cut costs. We're going to trim down our expenses. We're going to shut off investing. We're going to lay people off until we get a handle on this. I don't want any of that. What I want to hear is we're going to continue to push ahead with investing. We are really excited because this is an exceptional time where our business model shines. We're going to invest more to do more for our customers, to take care of our customers better. It's those types of businesses that I, I, I wanted to partner with. And I think that that's what made this period really, really unique. We don't often get sell-offs like this, right? Like we, we get a sell-off like this probably like once every 10 years like a massive sell-off like this. And, and at that time period, like it's really just a chance to like reassess and re-adjudicate and take advantage of the fact that everything's down and you now have a chance to really like kind of buy anything that you want. And why not buy those companies where everything's down, buy those companies that are going to take advantage of this crisis and become better businesses coming out of it than they were coming into it. Thank you. I'm a bit sorry because we are hitting the 90 minutes hurdle now and uh, <laughs> we're still having some questions, but I think we should stop at this point and maybe have the chance to have you back on in a few months or something like this. <laughs> or if people want to reach out to you, they are happy to do so, I think. Yeah, it'd be my pleasure. I, yeah. We always love connecting with really interesting people. I, I, you know, I'm a big believer in the adage. So Byron Wien has this adage, network intensely. This business requires a lot of luck. And there's no better way to maximize your luck than to know as many people as possible. So I love connecting with investors. I love connecting with business people. So if there's something here that really resonates and you want to get in touch, I'd love to hear from you. And you're also on Twitter. Dennis Hong 17, <laughs> I think it is. It's the ad. So people can follow you. That's, that's a great option. So thank you very much for the talk. Like maybe one question for the end. You like to post charts, a lot of charts. What is your favorite chart for 2020? Do you have one? Oh. Maybe actually, you have to retweet it on Twitter. Then people no, can you, find it there. Hey, um, Tillman, do you have uh, do you have screen share capability? I can open? I think you can do it in a second. Yeah. This chart. Do you see it? Yeah. This chart was so neat. So we created this chart internally just to make the point that within this crisis where all the economic shutdowns kind of happen and um, what was really neat about this, it, it took 10 years in the US to get e-commerce penetration from about five and a half percent to the double digits. 
But then in the course of eight weeks through that shutdown, you basically had 10 years worth of penetration happen within eight weeks. And it's like such a powerful illustration. We, we created this chart internally and got a little bit of notoriety. Um, it, it was one of those charts that kind of went viral. Um, and he, he, even I think the Shopify guys actually even uh, noted it, which is kind of cool. Cool. But um, I think what's like cool about this is a lot of people kind of talk about how all these like digital stocks, all these e-commerce stocks have really uh, gone up a lot over the last like couple months. And if it's true that we're entered a new paradigm and there's actually clinical psychology, a clinical psychology uh, theorizes that eight weeks of habitual usage ingrains a habit. And if it's true, and, and you know, many of these economies have been shut down for mm -hmm. like eight weeks. And if, it's, if that's true, then the trends that we've seen kind of accelerate could have some persistency which means that everything that you thought was going to happen in the out years in the modeling mm -hmm. has suddenly been accelerated to the presence. So in some sense, like there's a real chance that the free cash flows and the earnings and the revenues you thought you were going to earn three, four, five years from now actually have been kind of brought forward into the present, which is why it's not surprising to me that some of these stocks, these e-commerce stocks, these digital, uh, digital disruptors, these stocks have gone up a lot. And in fact, it could en end up being that if we've entered a new paradigm shift, that um, these, these businesses could continue to be quite attractively priced from here on out. Is it interesting to watch? Because there's also the question if things go back to a lower level, but we will see. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's, it's definitely, um, it's definitely an interesting, stop yeah. screen sharing. Oh, did I stop sharing? Let me just uh, make sure I s you stop this. There we go. Thank you very much. It, it's, it would be great if you stay on for a second and all, to all the others. Thank you very much for joining us. If you like the content, please leave a like, a comment, um, or subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. Thank you very <laughs> much, Dennis. Thank you, Tillman. It was great to be here, and I appreciate you making the time for me. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay.